Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, part of the Catholic Culture Podcast Network and a production of catholicculture.org. Visit our website for Catholic news, incisive commentary, and a treasure trove of other Catholic resources. Or sign up for one of our email newsletters at catholicculture.org slash newsletters. Today's reading, The Shepherd of Hermas, Parables 1 through 8, translated by Joseph M. F. Marik, S.J., Ph.D., narrated by James T. Majewski. First Parable Man has here no abiding city. With his possessions he should acquire riches before God by the practice of fraternal charity. He said to me, You know that you servants of God are living in a foreign country, for your city is far from this city. Now if you know the city in which you are eventually to dwell, why do you secure fields, rich establishments, houses, and superfluous dwellings? The person who secures such things for this city does not think of turning off to his real city. Foolish, miserable man of divided purpose, do you not realize that these superfluities belong to somebody else and are in the control of another? For the Lord of this city will say, I do not wish you to reside in my city. Go out of it, for you do not live according to my laws. So if you have fields, dwellings, and other property, what will you do with your field, your house, and the rest of your accumulations if you are cast out by him? The Lord of this country will justly tell you, Either live according to my laws or leave my country. What are you going to do then, since you are subject to the law of your own city? Are you going for the sake of your fields and the rest of your belongings, to renounce altogether your own proper law and walk according to the law of this city? Take care. It may be against your advantage to renounce your law. You may not be received if you wish to return to your city, because you have denied the law of your city and it will be closed to you. Therefore, you must be careful, while living in a foreign land, not to acquire a bit more than an adequate sufficiency. Be prepared so that, when the ruler of this city wishes to expel you for resisting his law, you may come out of his city and enter your own, and there rejoice without insolence in the observance of your own proper law. Be on your guard, then, you who serve God, and hold him in your heart. Keep in mind the commandments of God and the promises he made, and do his works. Be confident that he will fulfill his promises if his commandments are kept. Instead of fields, then, buy souls that are in trouble, according to your ability. Look after widows and orphans and do not neglect them. Spend your riches and all your establishments you have received from God on this kind of fields and houses. It was for this that the Master bestowed wealth on you, to perform this ministry for him. It is far better to buy such lands and possessions and houses, for you will find them when you settle in your own city. Such lavishness is good and cheerful, is free from grief and fear, full of joy. Do not perform the philanthropies of the pagans. They are of no use for the servants of God. Instead, be lavish in your own special way which can give you joy. Do not counterfeit. Do not lay hand on what belongs to another, and do not covet his possessions, for it is wicked to covet another man's possessions. Do your task, and you will be saved. Second Parable The alms of the rich to the poor are rewarded by God at the prayer of the poor. As I was walking in the country, I observed an elm and a vine, and compared them in their fruits. The shepherd appeared and said to me, What are you thinking of by yourself? I am thinking about the elm and the vine, I said. They are very well adapted to one another. These two trees, he said, are as a symbol for the servants of God. If only I could know the type which these trees you mention represent, I said. 
You have the elm and the vine before your eyes, he said. Yes, sir, I answered. This vine, he said, bears fruit, but the elm is sterile. However, this vine cannot bear fruit unless it climbs up the elm. Otherwise, it spreads all over the ground, and if it does bear, the fruit is rotten because it has not been hanging from the elm. So, when the vine has been attached to the elm, it bears fruit both from itself and from the elm. So, you see that the elm yields fruit also, not a bit less than the vine, more, in fact. How does it yield more, sir, I said? Because, he said, the vine that is hanging on the elm yields copious and sound fruit, but if it is spread on the ground, it bears rotten fruit and little of it. This parable, then, applies to all the servants of God, to both the poor as well as the rich man. Sir, I said, how is this the parable of the rich and the poor man? Let me know. I shall tell you, he answered. The rich man has great wealth, but so far as the Lord is concerned, he is poor, because he is distracted by his wealth. His confession, his prayer to the Lord, is very limited. That which he makes is insignificant and weak and has no power above. So when a rich man goes up to a poor man and helps him in his needs, he has the assurance that what he does for the poor man can procure a reward from God, for the poor man is rich in his power of intercession with God and in his confession. Therefore the rich man does not hesitate to supply the poor man with everything. On the other hand, the poor man who has been helped by the rich intercedes for him and gives thanks to God for his benefactor. And the latter is constantly solicitous for the poor man that he may not be in want during his life because he knows that the poor man's intercession is acceptable and rich in God's sight. Both fulfill their function in this way. The poor man makes intercession, these are his riches, and gives back to the Lord who supplied him. In the same way, the rich man unhesitatingly puts the riches he received from the Lord at the disposal of the poor. This is a great and acceptable work in the sight of God, for the rich man has understanding in his riches, and out of the bounties of the Lord he works in the poor man's behalf and rightly accomplishes the Lord's ministry. From men's point of view, the elm seems not to bear fruit, but they do not know or understand that in case of a drought, the elm holds water and supplies it to the vine. And so the vine, with an uninterrupted supply of water, yields double the amount of fruit, both for itself and for the elm. In the same way, the poor who direct prayer for the rich to the Lord round out their riches, while the rich, by supplying the needs of the poor, make up for the shortcomings of their souls. Both in this way become associates in the just work. By doing this, then, you will not be left in the lurch by God. No, you will be inscribed on the book of the living. Blessed are those who possess such riches and understand that riches are from the Lord. Those who understand this will be able to do some good deed. Third Parable The just and sinners are not notably different in externals. He showed me many leafless trees that seemed to me to be withered and all alike, and he said to me, Do you see these trees? Yes, sir, I said, I do. They are all dry and of the same kind. In answer, he said, The trees you see are the people living in this world. Why, I said, are they dry and alike? Because, he said, in this world neither the just nor sinners are manifest, but they are alike. For this world is winter for the just, and they are not distinguishable while living with sinners. For just as in winter trees that have shed their leaves are alike and do not look dry as they really are, or living, so in this world neither the just nor sinners look as they are, but all are alike. Fourth Parable just as the summer season brings out the difference between trees, so in the world to come will the just and sinners be distinguished. 
Once more he showed me trees, some in bloom and some shriveled, and said to me, Do you see these trees? Yes, sir, I said. I see some in bloom and some shriveled. Those that are in bloom, he said, are the just, destined to live in the world to come. For the world to come is summer for the just, but it is winter for sinners. When the Lord's mercy shines forth, then will God's servants be made manifest. So will all be made manifest. Just as in summer the fruits of every single tree come to light and we know what they are, so will the fruits of the just be manifest, and it will be known that all are flourishing in that world. Pagans and sinners, the dry trees you see, will be found to be dry and fruitless in that world. They will be burned as firewood and will be manifest because their activity in life was wicked. Sinners will be burned because they sinned without repenting. Pagans because they did not know their Creator. Bear fruit, then, so that your fruit may be known in that summer. Keep away from numerous occupations and you will not commit sin. For those who are engaged in multiple occupations also sin much, because they are distracted by their occupations and fail to serve their Lord. How, he said, can such a person ask and obtain anything from the Lord without serving the Lord? His servants are those who will obtain, but those who do not serve the Lord will not obtain their requests. However, if a person is occupied with only one business, he can also serve the Lord. For his heart will not be corrupted and turned aside from the Lord. He will still serve him by keeping his heart pure. By doing this, you can bear fruit for the world to come. So will everyone who does the same. Fifth Parable 1. Fasting on station days is not enough. True and genuine fasting means keeping God's commandments. While I was fasting, seated on a mountain and giving thanks to the Lord for all his benefits to me, I saw the shepherd seated beside me, saying to me, Why did you come here so early in the morning? Because I am keeping station, sir, I said. What is a station? he said. I am fasting, sir, I said. What is this fast you are engaged in? he said. I fast, sir, as I am accustomed, I said. You do not know how to fast to the Lord, he said, and this unprofitable fast you keep for him is not a fast either. Why do you say this, sir, I said. I declare that this is not a fast as you think it is, he said. I shall teach you what is a fast complete and acceptable to the Lord. Pay attention, he said. God does not wish vain fasting of this kind. When you fast thus for God's sake, you accomplish nothing for justice. Here is the fast you must keep for God. Do not commit any wicked deed in your life and serve the Lord with a pure heart. Keep His commandments by walking according to His directions and do not let any evil desire enter your heart. Have faith in God. If you do this and fear him and refrain from every evil act, you will live to God. And by doing this, you will also perform a fast that is great and acceptable to God. 2. The Industrious Laborer in the Vineyard Let me tell you the parable I have in mind relative to fasting. A man had a field and numerous servants, one part of the field he planted as a vineyard. Then he chose a dependable, respected, and honest servant, summoned him, and said, Take this vineyard I planted, and fence it in till I come. Do not do anything else to the vineyard. Do this, and you will receive from me your freedom. Then the master of that slave went off to a foreign country. When he had left, the slave took the vineyard and fenced it in. After finishing it, he noticed that the vineyard was full of weeds. He thought the matter over to himself and said, I have done what my master ordered. I shall next dig this vineyard, 
it will be neater after having been dug. Without weeds, it will yield more fruit, since the fruit will not be choked by weeds. So he went and dug the vineyard and plucked up all the weeds that were in it. Then the vineyard became very neat and flourishing, without any weeds to choke it. After a while, the master of the slave in the field returned to this vineyard. When he saw that the vineyard had been fenced in properly, and over and above this, had been dug and cleared of weeds, and that the vines were flourishing, he was exceedingly glad at the work of his slave. So he summoned his beloved son, who was his heir, and his friends, who were his advisers, and told them what he had ordered his slave to do, and what he found. They also were happy at the master's testimony in favor of his slave. The latter said to them, I promised freedom to this slave, if he observed the order I gave him. He has kept my order, and besides to my great pleasure has done a good work in the vineyards. So as a reward for this, I wish to make him joint heir with my son, because when the good thought came, he did not neglect it, but put it into execution. With this intention of his, the son of the master agreed. The slave should be joint heir. A few days later, his master had a banquet and sent him many dainties from the feast. The slave, however, took from the dainties sent him by his master only what was sufficient for himself and distributed the remainder to his fellow slaves. Then the fellow slaves, in their joy at receiving the dainties, began praying in his behalf that he might find even greater favor with his master, for he treated them so well. All this his master heard, and once more was exceedingly pleased with his conduct. So he called together his friends once more, and his son, and let them know what he had done with the dainties he had received. Those called together were all the more agreed that he should be joint heir with the son. 3. A true and genuine fast has a necessary connection with fraternal charity. I said, Sir, I do not know these parables, and cannot understand them, unless you explain them to me. I shall explain everything to you, he said, and anything I tell you I shall make clear to you. Keep the commandments of the Lord, and you will be well-pleasing to God. You will be inscribed in the number of those who keep his commandments. But if you do some good over and above God's commandment, you will acquire all the greater glory, and will be held in that much greater honor in the sight of God, with whom you are destined to be. Therefore, if you also perform these additional services while keeping God's commandments, joy will be yours, provided you observe them in accordance with my commands. I said to him, Sir, whatever command you give I shall observe, for I know that you are on my side. I shall be on your side, because you are zealous in doing good, he said. I shall also be on the side of all who show the same zeal. This fasting, which consists in the observance of the commandments of the Lord, he said, is very beautiful. This is the way to keep the fast you intend to observe. Before anything else, abstain from every wicked word and every evil desire, and clear your heart of all the vanities of this world. If you observe this, your fast will be perfect. Act as follows. After having done what is prescribed, on the day of your fast, do not taste anything except bread and water. Compute the total expense for the food you would have eaten on the day on which you intended to keep a fast, and give it to a widow, an orphan, or someone in need. In this way, you will become humble in soul, so that the beneficiary of your humility may fill his soul and pray to the Lord for you. If you perform your fast, then, in the way I have just commanded, your sacrifice will be acceptable in the sight of God, and this fast will be entered into the account in your favor. A service so performed is beautiful, joyous, and acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Observe this in the manner explained, together with your children and your whole household. In the observance you will be blessed, and all those who hear and observe this will also be blessed, and will receive all they ask from the Lord. 4. The Lord gives His true servants the grace to understand the parables. 
I urgently asked him to explain the parable of the field, the master, the vineyard, the slave fencing in the vineyard, the fences, the weeds plucked out of the vineyard, the sun, and the friendly advisers. For I understood that all this was a parable. He answered and said, You are exceedingly persistent in your questions. You do not have to ask anything at all, for if there is need of explanation, it will be given you. I said to him, Sir, if you do not explain what you show me, there is no use of my seeing it, since I do not understand what it means. Every time you tell me parables without giving me the key to them, I shall be listening to no purpose. He answered me again and said, Whoever is a servant of God and has his Lord in his heart, asks for understanding and gets it. He has the key to every parable, and the words of the Lord told him in parables become known. But the weak and sluggish in prayer ask the Lord hesitatingly. However, the Lord is abundant in his mercies and gives to those who make their petition without ceasing. Why do you not ask and receive understanding from the Lord? You have been strengthened by the holy angel. You have received an answer to similar intercessions, and you are not sluggish. So, ask of the Lord, and you will receive understanding. I said to him, Sir, since you are with me, I must ask and question you, for you show me everything, and now you are speaking with me. If I had seen and heard this away from you, I would ask the Lord to make it clear to me. 5. Explanation of the Parable of the Vineyard I have told you only now, he said, that you are shrewd and persistent in asking meaning of the parables. Since you are so patient, I shall elucidate for you the parable of the field and all the other points that follow so you can make them known to everybody. Listen, he said, and understand this. The field is this world. The Lord of the field is the one who has created everything and fitted things together and given them strength. The servant is the son of God, while the vines are the people he engendered. The fences are the holy angels of the Lord who support his people. The weeds plucked from the vineyard are iniquities of the servants of God. The food he sent are the commandments he gave to his people through his Son. The friends and advisers are the holy angels, his first creation. The departure of the master for a foreign land is the time left over before his coming. I said to him, Sir, all this is marvelous, great, and glorious. Really, I said, I could not have understood this. There is not a single man, no matter how clever he is, capable of understanding this. Once more, sir, explain what I am going to ask, I said. Ask whatever you please, he said. Why is the Son of God represented in the form of a slave in the parable, I said. 6. Why the Son of God has the part of a slave in the parable. Listen, he said, the Son of God is not represented in the form of a slave, but is represented with great power and majesty. How is that, I said, I do not understand. Because, he said, God planted the vineyard, that is to say, created his people and gave them over to his Son. The Son appointed the angels to watch over them, He himself cleansed their sins away by undergoing innumerable toils and labors, for nobody can dig without toil and labor. By cleansing their sins in person, he showed them the ways of life and gave them the law which he received from his Father. So you see, he said, that he himself is Lord of his people, because he has all power from his Father. Now let me tell you why the Lord took his Son and the glorious angels as advisors in the question of the slave's inheritance. The Holy Ghost, the pre-existent, the creator of all creations, was made by God to dwell in the flesh of his choice. This flesh, then, in which the Holy Spirit dwelt, was beautifully subject to the Spirit, and walked in holiness and purity, and sullied the Spirit in absolutely nothing. Therefore, 
The flesh was guided with beauty and purity by the Spirit, and shared his toil and labor in everything. Because the flesh had conducted itself with strength and courage, he associated it with the Holy Spirit, for he was pleased with the career of this flesh which had not been sullied while holding the Spirit on earth. Therefore he took the Son and the glorious angels as advisors, in order that the flesh might have some place of abode for its blameless subjection to the Spirit, and might not seem to have lost the reward of its service. For all flesh that has been found unsullied and spotless, in which the Holy Spirit has had his abode, will receive a reward. Here you have the solution of this parable. 7. Keep your body unsullied. I am delighted, sir, I said, to have heard this solution. Let me tell you further, he said. Preserve this flesh of yours, clean and unsullied, in order that the indwelling Holy Spirit may give testimony to it, and your flesh may be justified. Make sure that the thought never enters your heart that this flesh of yours is perishable, and that you misuse it by some defilement. For if you defile your flesh, you also defile the Holy Spirit, and if you defile your flesh, you will not live. If, I said, before these words were heard, there was some ignorance, how can a man who has sullied his flesh be saved? A remedy for previous ignorance is only possible to God, he said, for he has all power. However, preserve yourself now, and the omnipotent Lord, in his great mercy, will grant a remedy for past ignorance. In the future, sully neither flesh nor spirit, for the two are associates, and one cannot be sullied without the other. Keep both clean, then, and you will live to God. Sixth Parable 1. The Parable of the Joyous Shepherd and the Carefree Sheep While seated in my house and praising the Lord for all I had seen, I also reflected on the mandates. I thought that they were noble, possible of fulfillment, joyous, glorious, and capable of saving man's soul. So I said to myself, Happy I shall be if I walk in these mandates. So will anyone be who walks in them. As I was saying this to myself, I suddenly saw him seated beside me. He said to me, Why are you entertaining doubt about the mandates I gave to you? They are beautiful. Put aside all doubt, clothe yourself with faith in the Lord, and walk in them. I shall give you strength to keep them. These mandates are advantageous for those who intend to repent. For if they do not walk in them, their repentance is worthless. You who repent must cast off the wickedness of this world which wears you down. If you put on every excellence of justice, you can observe these mandates and keep from committing any additional sins. If you do not add to your former sins, you will walk in these mandates and live to God. All this you have been told by me. After telling me this, he said, Let us go into the field, and I shall show you the shepherds with their sheep. Yes, sir, I said, let us go. On going into the field, he pointed out to me a young shepherd dressed in a suit of saffron-colored garments. He was feeding an extremely large number of sheep, who were apparently well-fed and frisky and gambling joyously here and there. The shepherd himself was happy with his flock, and his whole appearance was joyous as he ran among his sheep. 2. This shepherd is the angel of pleasure and deceit. He said to me, Do you see this shepherd? Yes, sir, I said. This, he said, is the angel of luxury and deceit. He wears down the souls of God's servants and makes them turn away from the truth by deceiving them with evil desires that are their death. Consequently, they forget the commandments of the living God and walk in deceits and vain luxury. Thus are they led to destruction by this angel, some to death, some to corruption. I said to him, Sir, 
I do not know what this means, death and corruption. I shall tell you, he said. The sheep you see joyously gambling are those who have been completely drawn away from God and have surrendered themselves to the lusts of this world. For these persons there is no repentance unto life, because God's name is being blasphemed by them. Their life is death. The sheep you see not gambling, but standing in one place and grazing, are those who have given themselves up to luxury and deceit, but have not committed any blasphemy against the Lord. They are those, then, who have been led away from the truth. There is hope of repentance for them, and so of life. Their perversion, then, holds some hope of renovation, but death means everlasting ruin. Once more we went forward a little distance, and he pointed out to me a shepherd, large and quite savage in appearance. He was dressed in a white goat skin, with a bag on his shoulders. In his hands was a very rough staff with knots in it and a whip. His look was so fierce that I was afraid of him. This shepherd was constantly receiving from a young shepherd sheep that were frisky and well-fed, but not gambling about, and he threw them into a place that was steep and full of thorns and thistles. The sheep could not disentangle themselves from the thorns and thistles, therefore, but became entangled in them. These sheep entangled in the thorns and thistles were very miserable because they were being beaten by him. Though they went here and there, he gave them no rest. They could not lie down at ease anywhere at all. 3. The Avenging Angel Hands Over His Charge to the Angel of Penance When I saw them whipped like this and in misery, I was sorry for them. Such was their torment without any respite whatever. I said to the shepherd who was talking to me, Sir, who is this heartless and savage shepherd so utterly without pity for these sheep? He is the avenging angel, he said, one of the just angels entrusted with punishment. He takes those who have wandered away from God and have walked in the lusts and deceits of this world and punishes according to their deserts with varied, dreadful punishments. I would like to know, sir, I said, what these varied punishments are. I shall tell you, he said. The tortures and punishments are temporal. Some are punished with losses, some by poverty, some by diverse sicknesses, some by lack of any permanent abode, some from the insults of unworthy persons and sufferings of all kinds. For many persons who are unsettled in their plans set their hands at many things, but make no progress at all in them. They say that they are not doing well in their pursuits, but it does not occur to them that they have committed wicked deeds. Instead, they blame the Lord. When they have suffered every affliction, they are handed over to me for sound instruction. Then they are strengthened in the faith of the Lord, and for the rest of their life they serve the Lord with a pure heart. Now when they repent, they recall the evil deeds that they committed, and at that point they praise God. They declare that God is a just judge, and that they suffered each in the measure of his actions. In the future, they serve the Lord with pure hearts and prosper in their pursuits, receiving from the Lord everything they ask for. Then, too, they praise the Lord for having been handed over to me and never again suffer any evil. 4. The Duration of Pleasure and of Punishment I said to him, Sir, explain one more thing to me. What is your question? he said. Sir, I said, are those who live in luxury and deceit tortured for as long a time as they lived in self-indulgence and deceit? Yes, just as long, he said. Sir, I said, they are put to the torture a very short time. They ought to be tortured seven times as long for living in self-indulgence and forgetting God as they do. He said to me, you are foolish and do not understand the power of the torture. If I did understand, sir, I would not have asked you to explain it to me, I said. Let me tell you the power of the two. The time of self-indulgence and deceit 
is one hour, but the hour of torture is the equivalent of thirty days. So if anyone indulges himself or allows himself to be deceived for a single day, a single day's torture has the effectiveness of a whole year. A man is tortured then for as many years as there were days of self-indulgence. So you see, he said, that though the period of self-indulgence and deceit is very short, the period of punishment and torture is protracted. 5. There is harmful and profitable pleasure. Sir, I said to him, I still do not understand fully about the period of deceit and indulgence and the period of torture. Give me a clearer explanation. For answer he said to me, Your foolishness is persistent, and you do not wish to cleanse your heart and serve God. Take care, he said, lest the time be fulfilled and it should be found that you are foolish. Let me tell you then, he said, that you may understand as you wish. The luxurious liver and the man deceived for a single day, who does what he pleases, is clothed in considerable foolishness without realizing his performance. The next day, he forgets what he did the day before. For self-indulgence and deceit have no memory because of that foolishness in which they are clothed. But when punishment and torture are imposed on a man for a single day, it is as punishment and torture for a whole year. For punishment and torture have long memories. So the man who is punished and tortured for a whole year remembers at last his self-indulgence and deceit, and he knows that he suffers evil for that reason. Consequently, every self-indulgent and deceived man is tortured in this way, because though he had life, he gave himself up to death. What kinds of self-indulgence, I said, are harmful, sir? Every act performed with pleasure is self-indulgence for man, he said. For example, a sharp-tempered man, by giving satisfaction to his passion, is self-indulgent. So the adulterer, the drunkard, the slanderer, the liar, the envious, the robber, and anyone who commits similar sins gives free rein to his individual vice. Consequently, he is self-indulgent in his action. All these acts of self-indulgence are harmful to God's servants. It is for these deceits that those who are punished and tortured suffer. However, there are acts of self-indulgence that bring salvation to human beings. For there are many persons who are self-indulgent in their good actions, who are carried away by the pleasure this gives them. This kind of self-indulgence, then, is advantageous for God's servants and secures life for this type of man whereas the harmful self-indulgence mentioned above brings them punishment and torture, and if they persist without repenting, they bring death on themselves. Seventh Parable Hermas is handed over to the avenging angel for the sins of his household. After a few days, I saw him in the same plain where I had also seen the shepherds, and he said to me, what are you looking for? I am here, sir, I said, to have you command the avenging shepherd to leave my house, because he is afflicting me very much. You have to be afflicted, he said. Such is the injunction of the glorious angel in your regard, he said. For he wants you to be put to the test. What have I done, sir, that is so wicked that I must be handed over to this angel, I said. I shall tell you, he said. Your sins are numerous, but not so numerous that you must be handed over to this angel. However, your household has committed many sins and iniquities, and the glorious angel is embittered at their deeds. Hence he has given orders that you should be afflicted for a while, that they also may repent and cleanse themselves of every lust of this world. When they repent and are cleansed, then the angel will desist from punishment. I said to him, Sir, granted that they have committed acts to embitter the glorious angel, what have I done? They cannot be otherwise afflicted, he said, unless you, the head of the whole household, suffer affliction. For if you suffer affliction, they also will necessarily be afflicted. 
but if you fare well, they suffer no affliction at all. But look, sir, I said, they have repented with their whole heart. I also know, he said, that they have repented with their whole heart. Do you think, then, that there is immediate remission from sin with repentance? Not at all, no. The one who repents must torture his soul and be thoroughly humble in all his actions and afflicted in a variety of ways. If he endures the afflictions that come to him, mercy to the full will be granted by the Creator of all things, who also has given him strength and who will grant a remedy. This God will do when he sees the penitent's heart free from all wickedness. But it is to the advantage of you and your household that you be afflicted now. What more need I say to you? You must be afflicted in accordance with the orders of that angel of the Lord who handed you over to me. Give thanks to the Lord also for this, that you were considered worthy beforehand of some indication of the affliction destined for you. By knowing it in advance, you will endure it with fortitude. I said to him, Sir, be on my side, and I shall be able to endure every affliction. I shall be on your side, he said, and I shall also ask the avenging angel to send you milder afflictions. However, you must be afflicted a short time, and then restored once more to your house. Only continue in your humble service of the Lord with a clean heart, your children too, and your household. Walk in the commandments I have given you, and it will be possible for your repentance to be strong and clean. If you observe these commandments, together with your whole house, all affliction will pass from you. So will it pass also from all who walk in these commandments of mine, he said. Eighth Parable 1. The Parable of the Willow He showed me an ample willow, covering plains and mountains, and in its shelter came all those called by the name of the Lord. The glorious, exceedingly tall angel of the Lord stood by the willow with a mighty sickle. He was lopping off branches and distributing them to the people in the shelter of the willow. He also distributed small rods, about two feet long. After everyone had received rods, the angel put aside his sickle, yet the tree was as sound as when I had first seen it. I wondered at this to myself and said, How can the tree be sound after so many branches have been lopped from it? The shepherd said to me, Do not wonder that the tree remains sound after so many branches have been lopped from it. Let this go until you have seen everything, and the meaning will be made clear to you. The angel who had distributed the rods was asking them back from them. In the order in which they had received the rods, they were summoned to him, and each returned his rod to him. The angel of the Lord received them and scrutinized them carefully. From some he took rods dry and apparently worm-eaten. To those who had returned such rods he gave orders to stand apart. Others returned rods that were dry but not worm-eaten. These persons also he ordered to stand aside. Others returned rods that were half dry and they stood at the side. Another group returned rods with cracks in them and they stood apart. Another class gave up rods green and cracked and stood apart. Others gave him rods half green and half cracked and stood apart. Others brought him rods two-thirds green and one-third dry and stood apart. Others returned rods two-thirds dry and one-third green and stood apart. Others returned their rods almost totally green with a very small portion dry, the tip. There were cracks in them also. Then they stood apart. The rods of others were green only in a very small portion, and the rest were dry. They also stood apart. Others came and brought rods that were green just as they had received them from the angel. The majority of the crowd returned rods of this kind. With them the angel was exceedingly pleased. They also stood apart. Others returned rods that were green with buds on them. They also stood apart, and the angel was likewise highly pleased with them. Others returned rods that were green with buds on them, and the rods apparently had some fruit. The persons whose rods were found to be in this condition were very joyous. The angel also was exultant with them, and the shepherd very cheerful. 2. 
the bearers of green branches are rewarded. The angel of the Lord ordered crowns to be brought. When the crowns apparently made of palm had been brought, he bestowed them on those who had returned rods with buds and some fruit and sent them to the tower. He also sent the rest of them to the tower, those who had returned rods that were green and budding but without fruit, after giving them a seal. On their way to the tower they all had the same cloak, white as snow. He also sent off those who had returned rods that were green as when they received them, after giving them a white cloak and seals. This finished, the angel said to the shepherd, I am going away. Send off these persons to dwell in their place within the walls according to their deserts. Send them off only after having looked carefully at their rods. Yes, scrutinize them carefully. Make sure that no one slips by you, he said. But if someone does go by you, I shall put him to the test at the altar. With these words to the shepherd, he went away. After the departure of the angel, the shepherd said to me, Let us take the rods of all and plant them. Perhaps some of them may be able to live. I said to him, Sir, how can these dry rods live? He answered and said, This tree is a willow and naturally tenacious of life. So if they are planted and get a little moisture, many of the rods will live. Then we shall try to pour water on them also. If any of them can live, I shall join in its joy. But if it cannot live, it will be discovered that I was not unsolicitous. The shepherd ordered me to call them just as they were stationed. They came up rank by rank and returned their rods to the shepherd. On receiving them, the shepherd planted the rods row by row. After planting them, he poured water on them so copiously that the rods could not be seen in the water. After he had watered the rods, he said to me, Let us go. After a few days we shall return and look at all the rods. For he who created this tree wishes all who have taken branches from it to live. I also hope that the majority of these rods, after receiving moisture and having been watered, will live. 3. Explanation of the Tree and Its Branches I said to him, Sir, tell me what this tree is. I am puzzled about it. After so many branches have been cut, it is sound and does not look as if anything had been cut from it. This really puzzles me. I shall tell you, he said. This tree that covers plain and mountain and the whole earth is the law of God, given to the whole world. This law is the Son of God proclaimed to the ends of the earth. The persons under its shelter are the persons who have heard the proclamation and believed in him. The great and glorious angel is Michael, who has power over this people and is their captain. For it is Michael who inspires the law in the hearts of believers. He inspects closely the persons to whom he gave it to see whether they have kept the law. You can see the rods of each individual person for they are the law. You see that many rods have been made useless, so you can know that all these persons failed to keep the law. You will also see their dwelling. Sir, I said to him, why did he send some to the tower while he left some behind? He has left behind in my power those who violated the law they received from him, to see whether they will repent. But those who have already satisfied the law and have kept it, he keeps under his own jurisdiction. Sir, I said, who are those who have received their crowns and have gone into the tower? They are those who have wrestled with the devil and have defeated him. They are crowned. They are the ones who suffered for the law, who have returned in person green rods with buds but without fruit, have endured persecution for the law but have not suffered. However, they did not deny their law. Those who returned their rods green as they received them are holy and just and walk in extreme purity of heart, keeping the commandments of the Lord. The rest you will know when I inspect closely the rods that were planted and watered. 4. The Examination of the Branches Planted in the Ground So after a few days we came to the spot and the shepherd sat in the place of the angel while I took a position beside him. He said to me, Tie a towel around you and wait on me. 
so I tied a clean towel of sackcloth and was ready to wait on him. Call the men, he said, whose rods have been planted, according to the rank in which each presented the rods. And I went to the plain and called everyone. They stood according to their ranks. He said to them, Let each one pull up his rod and bring it to me. The first to return them were those who had dry and chipped rods, and so they were found, dried and chipped. He commanded them to stand aside. Then those who had dry but not chipped rods returned them. Some returned the rods green, but some returned them dried and chipped apparently by worms. So he commanded those who had returned them green to stand aside, but those who returned them dry and chipped were to stand with the first class. Then those who had half-dried and cracked rods returned them. Many of them gave back green rods without cracks, but some green rods with buds, but some green rods with buds and fruit on the buds like the persons who had been crowned and had entered the tower. However, some returned them dry and worm-eaten, others dried but not worm-eaten, while some were half-dry and had cracks. And he commanded each one of them to stand aside, some in their own ranks and others by themselves. 5. Further Explanation of the Meaning of the Branches Then those who had green rods with cracks returned them. Since these all had green rods, they stood in their own ranks. The shepherd was pleased with them because their rods had all changed and had lost their cracks. Then those who had half-green and half-dry rods also returned them. The rods of some were found to be completely green, of others half-dried, of others still dried and worm-eaten but some were green and had buds. All these were sent each to his rank. Then those whose rods were two-thirds green and one-third dry returned them. Many of them returned green rods, many returned half-dried rods, and the rest dried and worm-eaten rods. All these stood in their ranks. Then those who had two-thirds dry and one-third green returned them. Many of them returned half-dried rods, but some returned dry and worm-eaten rods, some rods half-dried with cracks, a few returned green ones. All these persons stood in their ranks. Those who had had rods with a very small dry portion in cracks returned them. Of this number some returned them green and others green with buds. These also went off to their ranks. Then those who had rods with a very small portion green but otherwise dry returned them. In this group, the majority were discovered to have rods that were green with buds and fruit on the buds, while the rest of the rods were completely green. The shepherd was exceedingly pleased with those whose rods were found in this condition. They all went off, each to his own rank. 6. The Meaning of the Individuals Bearing Dry Branches After looking closely at all the rods, the shepherd said to me, I told you that this tree clings to life. Do you see, he said, how many repented and were saved? Yes, I do, I said. It is, he said, that you may realize that the superabundant mercy of the Lord is mighty and glorious, and that he has granted his spirit to those who are worthy of repentance. Why is it, sir, I said, that all do not repent? He has granted repentance to those whose heart, he sees, is going to be made pure, and who will serve him with their whole heart. But lest his name be again defiled, he has not granted repentance to those whose guile and wickedness he saw, for they were making a sham of repentance. I said to him, Now, sir, explain what sort of persons they are, and where is the dwelling of those who returned their rods, in this way, believers who have received the seal, but have broken it and failed to keep it whole, may realize what they have done and repent. Then they will receive a seal from you and will praise the Lord for having had mercy on them and for sending you to renew their souls. I shall tell you, he said. The persons whose rods were discovered to be dry and worm-eaten are apostates and traitors to the church who blaspheme the Lord by their sins. Furthermore, they were ashamed of the name of the Lord the name invoked upon them. In the end, these persons are lost to God. You see that not one of them has repented, though they heard what you told them at my command. From persons of this kind, life has departed.
Those also are like to them who returned dry rods not worm-eaten, for they are hypocrites who introduce strange doctrines and pervert the servants of God. In particular, they pervert sinners by not allowing them to repent, but dissuade them by foolish doctrines. However, there is prospect of repentance for them. Many of them, as you see, have repented since you spoke my commandments to them. More will repent. But those who will not repent have lost their life. However, those of their number who have repented have become good, and their dwelling is within the first walls. Some even went up to the tower. So you see, he said, that repentance for sins means life, but failure to repent means death. 7. The Bearers of Half-Dried Branches Now, let me tell you also about those who returned half-dried rods with cracks in them. Those whose rods were half-dry throughout are the persons of doubtful heart. They are neither dead nor alive. Those who are half-dry and have cracks are persons of divided purpose and slanderers. They are never at peace with one another and always cause dissensions. But for them also repentance is possible. You see, he said, some from this class who have repented. There is still, he said, hope of repentance for them. All of this class who have repented, he said, also have a dwelling in the tower. However, those who were slower in their repentance dwell in the walls, while those who do not repent but persist in their practices die the death. Those who have returned their rods green though cracked always were faithful and good, but there was some little jealousy among them about first places and points of reputation, foolish to be opposed to one another about first places. But these also, after hearing my commandments, were cleansed and soon repented, since they are good. Their dwelling, therefore, is in the tower. But if any turn aside again and are divided in purpose, they will be cast out of the tower and will lose their life. Life belongs to all who keep the Lord's commandments. Now in the commandments there is nothing about first places in any point of honor, but about man's long-suffering and humility. The life of the Lord, then, is to be found in men of this kind, but death is among those of doubtful heart and among transgressors. 8. The Bearers of Partly Green and Partly Dry Branches Those who gave up rods half dry and half green are the persons engrossed in their business, who fail to cling to holiness. For this reason one half is living and the other half is dead. So many who have heard my commandments have repented. Those that repented, then, have a dwelling in the tower, but some of them stood off to the end. They, therefore, have no repentance, for they blasphemed the Lord and denied him on account of their business affairs. Consequently, they lost their life because of their wicked practices. Many of this group were of doubtful heart. These will still have repentance, provided they repent in good time then they will have a dwelling in the tower. Even if they repent rather slowly, they dwell within the tower. But if they fail to repent, they also have lost their life. Those who returned rods two-thirds green and one-third dry are the persons who denied the Lord on diverse occasions. Many of this group have repented and returned to the tower to dwell. However, many fell away from God completely. These finally lost life, and some of this group were doubters at heart and caused dissensions. So they have repentance if it comes in good time and if they do not persist in their self-indulgence, but if they do persist in their ways, they also work death for themselves. 9. The Bearers of the Two-Thirds Dry Branches Those who returned their rods two-thirds dry and one-third green are the persons who had been faithful but became rich and made a name among pagans. They put on a supercilious demeanor, became haughty, and so abandoned the truth and did not cling to the just. Instead they lived in the manner of the pagans and among them, a manner of life more agreeable to them. However, they did not fall away from God but clung to the faith without doing its works. Many of them repented and their dwelling was in the tower but others who lived and associated constantly with the pagans were corrupted by their vain opinions to fall away from God and act in the manner of the pagans. Such persons are considered pagans.
Others in this group were doubting hearts and had no hope of being saved on account of their deeds. Others again were doubters at heart and caused divisions among their associates. There is still repentance for those who, because of their actions, doubt. However, if they would have a dwelling within the tower, their repentance must be swift. But death is at hand to those who do not repent and persist in their pleasures. 10. The Bearers of the Green Tip Branches Those who returned their rods green but dry-tipped and cracked were always good, faithful, and glorious in the sight of God, but they committed sin in a small degree out of trifling desires because they had petty quarrels with one another. The majority quickly repented on hearing my words, and their dwelling was set in the tower. But some were doubtful of heart, and in their doubts they created a greater dissension. Still there is some hope of repentance for them, because at all times they were good. Any of them is hardly likely to die. Those who returned their rods dry with only the slightest touch of green are believers, but their actions were those of iniquity. However, they never fell away from God and bore the name gladly. In their houses they also received God's servants graciously. So when they heard of this penance, they repented without hesitation, and now they are accomplishing all virtue and justice. Some of them, too, are willing to suffer affliction of their own free will, because they realize the malice of their former actions. The dwelling of all these persons, then, is the tower. 11. The call to conversion is made to all. After finishing the explanation of all the wrongs, he said to me, Go off and tell everybody to repent and live to God. The Lord in his mercy has sent me to grant repentance to all, although some are unworthy because of their works. But in his long suffering, the Lord wishes those that were called through his Son to be saved. I said to him, Sir, I hope that those who have heard this will repent. I am quite sure that each one who realizes his personal acts will repent out of fear of the Lord. He answered and said, those who repent with their whole heart and cleanse themselves of all the wickedness just described without ever adding to their former sins will receive from the Lord a remedy for their former sins. Provided they are not beset by doubt in fulfilling my commandments, they will live to God. But those who add to their sins and revert to the lusts of this world will bring the judgment of death on themselves. As for you, Walk in my commandments and live to God. They too will live to God who walk in these commandments and act uprightly. After showing and telling me all this, he said, I shall show you the rest in a few days. This has been the Shepherd of Hermas, Parables 1 through 8, translated by Joseph M. F. Marik, S. J., Ph.D., narrated by James T. Majewski, copyright 1947 by the Catholic University of America Press, production copyright 2024 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this and more at catholicculture.org.